Good afternoon, everyone, or good morning still, I should say. It's only 1130. Uh, welcome to today's luncheon. A uh, couple of quick housekeeping announcements. Um, please make sure to register to attend our state conference that will be held here in downtown St. Louis from, on October 5th through the 7th. Um, we would love to see everyone. Uh, we are limiting registration this year, so make sure to sign up now if you'd like to attend. Uh, moving on, today's luncheon, we have a great uh, topic and speaker for you. Our topic is top 10 things about building codes that every planner needs to know. And our presenter is Joe Iliff, who is the Building and Zoning Director of Swansea, Illinois. So a great opportunity to hear from somebody who oversees both the building and zoning code. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Joe. Uh, after his presentation, we'll have Q&A, so please hold your questions until then. Thank you. Go ahead, Joe. Thank you, everybody. Yes, uh, uh, glad to uh, be here and get to talk with uh, my fellow uh, city planners out here about uh, something that I've had to learn about through my uh, journey as a, uh, a, a local administrator of, of land use regulations and uh, things where uh, I have had to to uh, migrate over into uh, the wonderful world of building codes. And uh, I've had to learn these uh, as an outsider uh, coming in and uh, begun to uh, develop a, a real appreciation for, uh, for what they are and how they work. And I can remember back in my days as a city planner uh, where that was exclusively what I did, the building code was just kind of a thing I didn't really understand sometimes it made sense sometimes it didn't and i i just let somebody else deal with it and uh, it's not always an option today especially in my job where i have to do both of these so we'll talk a little bit about uh that kind of uh, uh relation uh, journey that i've had with this and, and the relationship i built with the codes so my objectives for everyone on the the webinar today um, is to learn is to help you guys learn a couple of these things so understanding how the building codes protect people and property um and that just makes sense that they would be uh that that's kind of number one is to develop an appreciation for what they're really trying to do um and the uh process for approving variations from the strict applications of codes one of the things that people think about is that codes are very rigid and uh and, and prescriptive and dogmatic and they don't have uh, a lot of uh uh judgment involved in how they're applied or whatever but really there's flexibility and there's opportunities for alternatives and modifications and we'll talk about some of that we'll talk about how the life safety codes and, and the building code family um, contribute to achieving larger social goals we're not necessarily talking about any one building or just the occupants of that building but a whole communities whole countries all of those kinds of things. We'll talk about some of the key terms that are used. Um, vocabulary, jargon is uh, an important part of, of any discipline and the building codes have their own language and their own way they use things. We'll talk about that. Um, really, I wanna equip all of you who are attending and who deal with uh, zoning codes, subdivision codes, architectural standards, uh, planning and zoning commissions, uh, review boards, anything like that to be able to uh, think like a building inspector, think like a building plans reviewer, think like a building official. Um, if you can kind of put yourself in their shoes when you're doing something, uh, uh, it can help out a lot. One of the things that I benefited from in the early part of my career was uh, to, because I was oftentimes the first point of entry for someone coming into the municipality where I was working. They had a, a vague idea of what they were doing or they had a property they were interested in, and they're just looking at a big overall concept to see is this fertile ground for for a good development that's gonna that's gonna benefit them, or is this a, a dead end road? And let's find out early so that they know to 
to shift gears and, and look for something else. So I had to think about those kinds of things of not just, well, you're going to have to file a plat, and you're going to have to get the zoning approval, maybe go to the architectural review commission, something like that. But think about what's a fire marshal going to think? What's a building official going to think? What's a water department going to think? What's a sewer department going to think? Um, you know, what are these other entities uh, going to do at state at, at phase three, phase four of a project? And to think that far ahead and to go re reach those professionals and say, what, what do you foresee on this? Um, so I like I developed the ability to do that. And I want other planners to, because oftentimes you're just, you're the first person in. And if you can find out if a project is uh, on a good track or on a bad track early, it can make such a difference for you and for your customers. And so all of this is really just to encourage that cross-discipline collaboration. Planning is by nature multidisciplinary. Uh, you touch all kinds of things that uh, go on in a community. So the more you can say, think like uh, another person in a profession, think like one of those specialists, um, the better you are to serve your community and your customers. So that's really what I'm what I'm doing here, specifically today about uh, the, the building and the life safety codes. So a little bit about me. Uh, this is uh, uh, what I do outside of my day job. Um, I do this under the banner called Seek Out Wisdom. Um, it's my Twitter handle and my Instagram if you want to follow me there. Uh, and I've got my LinkedIn pretty easy to find me there and my personal email. Um, and so these are the certifications that, that I carry. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about my journey of this, but uh, I am a, a member of AICP, uh, as well as certified for uh, building official and residential inspections. Uh, I've also got floodplain manager. I do code enforcement work here in Swansea, so I have certifications for that uh, and code officer safety. So uh, I've collected uh, quite a few uh, certifications over my uh, career of uh, dealing with all these kinds of things through the uh, uh, through the from from initial concept of development to uh, construction to occupancy and and property maintenance after that, uh, but I want to put my contact information out there and I'll have the slide again at the uh, end. Okay, so uh, yeah, I uh, completed. Uh, I grew up in Indianapolis, finished high school. Thought I wanted to be an architect and found out, like a lot of city planners, I can't draw. And I did not, I decided architecture was not, not going to be the thing for me. But um, luckily at uh, Ball State University, where I was going, in addition to architecture, they also have uh, degrees in urban planning. And I went and got a, a bachelor's of urban planning from uh, Ball State. And uh, then a few years later, after I'd gotten the necessary work experience, uh, I passed the exam to uh, become a member of uh, AICP. And uh, goodness, have I been an AIC me P AICP member for uh, 21 years now. It's been a long ride. But uh, so for the first uh, 10, 15, 10, 12 years of my career, I really worked just as a uh, city planner. I did uh, development review. I did long range plans. Uh, I did presentations in front of planning commissions and city councils and text updates and created new zoning districts and, uh, you know, updated the, the home based business regulations and all the kinds of things that that we do. And uh, that was all of my job for uh, the first the first real phase of my career, just going up through the ranks to uh, get to uh, planner, planner to senior planner. Uh, kind of positions doing uh, doing all those things in uh, the planning department and wandering over to building inspections and the fire marshal and the public works department uh, as projects uh, demanded and that kind of stuff and trying to kind of read over their notes so uh, so what what do you guys think when you look at a project what kind of questions do you uh, want to know when someone comes to me and they're asking about uh, you know putting putting this building on that property uh, what are the kinds of things that uh, the questions Questions that immediately come to the fire marshal's uh, mind, or the uh, the sewer sewer uh, wastewater plant manager, or something like that. So I started to try to think about those kinds of other disciplines. 
Oh, let me, let me back up one more. So then later, uh, after my uh, first years of just doing planning, I got into a job in a small town where I had to be both planner and building official. So I had one full-time inspector I had to supervise. And then uh, I also had to go out and do inspections where they were on vacation or they were out of the office or we just had too many inspections to do. So I went and got certifications to be a building official and be the building, to also be a building inspector uh, and, and added that to my repertoire for uh, a few years. And then a little later after that, we had our floodplain manager leave and we needed somebody on staff who was a certified floodplain manager. So I went out and got that. And then as my uh, jobs have progressed and my my uh, field of responsibility has included more and more things. I've added more certifications onto that. But I really came into all those other professions as a city planner. And I find when I talk with people uh, from uh, who are building code officials, building inspectors, oftentimes they come from the trades. They're a contractor, they're an electrician, they're a plumber. Um, they come up through the construction side um, of someone who was actually going out there and, uh, you know, building houses and bidding jobs and, and doing the work of construction, uh, whereas I came to the building official, building inspector world from being uh, another government regulator, from, from enforcing zoning codes and subdivision ordinances and things like that, and now going over to enforcing the building codes. I'm not a builder. I've never uh, done construction. I haven't built a house. Uh, I really come to the codes from an aspect of somebody who takes the languages of government regulations and try to make them work in the real world and not someone who who has uh, has actually gone out there and, and done all of this. Um, so I have a little bit of a different take when I'm over talking to, with other building officials and stuff about how this works because I kind of shifted over from a related profession rather than just rising up through uh, the world of, of building codes and inspections. So I've kind of pulled out from my experience the 10 things that I think um, I wanted, I, I benefit as a city planner knowing about the building codes um, and the things that I would want uh, a planner uh, to think about and, and to have in their toolbox that when they're working on a project or when you're interacting with uh, coworkers uh, who live in the building inspection world and that's their thing, um, you can kind of build that relationship with them and you can think about a project a little more holistically than you already do uh, because you can add those kinds of components and factors into it uh, and get familiar with the language and concepts of how the building code works. Um, it really is something that can be accessible with a little bit of, uh, of training and a little bit of experience with it. So don't let it scare you too much. So we'll get into these. And like I said, we'll have uh, time for, for questions at the end, I think. So uh, number 10 on our top 10 list is that the building code is more than one code. We often talk about it as the building code, but in reality, uh, it is a whole group of codes. I, I know when I grew up, there was just one Spider-Man, and now evidently it seems like there's a whole family of Spider-Mans, Batmans, and whoever else, because one just isn't enough. So uh, this is just kind of my reminder that uh, it is a it is a group of codes. So within uh, the the family that we see most. Uh, all across the country that are all written by the ICC, the International Code Council, uh, are a whole group of codes. So I'm going to lay them out here for you. There's the building code, the international residential code, the international fire code. So there are separate codes for all of these aspects of a building, plumbing, mechanical, uh, the property maintenance code, uh, the swimming pool and spa code. Um, there is the private sewage disposal code, uh, the international energy conservation code, the fuel gas code, uh, the existing building code. That's a good one for planners to know about. We'll talk a little bit about that. Um, it's not a code but there are solar energy provisions now that have been added to this family to make buildings ready for uh, taking advantage of photovoltaic uh, generation and power sources. Um, there's even some, some uh, a little more obscure codes like the Wildland Urban Interface Code, which has to deal with like uh, wildfires where you have uh, you want buildings protected from like uh, wildland fire risks. Um, and there is even ICC even publishes something that gets a little bit into the territory of city planners with the International Zoning Code. Uh, it's actually not bad. It's a fairly simplistic 
uh, a set of, uh, you know, basic Euclidean zoning, um, talks about a plan commission, the separating out a couple of different uses, how many park or different zoning districts, how many parking spaces for different kinds of usage and a basic sign code. If, if a, a community ever just wanted, we just, we need a zoning code we can just pick up off the shelf and, and put in place and run with it. It's actually not a bad, uh, not a bad little uh, code from, uh, from a city planning point of view. So uh, there's a whole family of these ICC codes uh, that we talk about. So if we ever, if I ever use the singular of just building code, it's probably some combination of all of these, but sometimes we do talk about codes, plural, uh, as to, uh, as to one code, depending on how, how specific we're being with our language. So there is a family of, <laughs> excuse me, of all of these codes that work together. And I do like to think about this sometimes as not just being a building code, because oftentimes we're talking about things that aren't buildings. Uh, swimming pools aren't buildings. The property maintenance code deals with uh, stagnant water on the property or the height of grass. Like if you have to uh, cite someone for not mowing their grass, that's in the property maintenance code. Now that might also be a nuisance under your own local regulations or something, but we are dealing with things that aren't necessarily quote unquote buildings um, or components of buildings if we're dealing with uh, something that's uh, uh, freestanding or just a condition of the of the property in general, whether it has a building on it or not. So uh, I sometimes think about these things again as life safety codes if you want to be thinking about them in the in the broad uh, inclusive uh, language. Number nine. So while we have all of these family of codes that all interrelate and work together to uh, create, hopefully, a safe built environment, um, there is one special code that I want to pull out and highlight for you. So this is number nine, the one code to unite them all, just like the uh, the ring and the Lord of the Rings that is the, the one ruler of all of everything. Uh, and that is the International Residential Code. So it's a little different from all these other codes. And it's different because it only applies to certain kinds of structures. So you have to be one of three different types of structures to fall in the category of the residential code. So those are single family dwellings, two family dwellings, and townhouses. So if you're going to build one of those uh, with some restrictions, you can fall under this code, the International Residential Code, and then you're not subject to all the different separate codes uh, of the rest of the family. So it's just within the IRC. This applies to both detached and attached. So single family uh, detached, single family attached, duplexes, townhomes. Um, so this can actually apply to a fairly big structure if you get lots of townhomes all stacked up next to each other, six, eight, 10 townhome units. It could be a really big building um, that's actually multiple townhouse units and all built under the residential code. There is a require a restriction, though, that none of these buildings can be more than three stories above grade plane, um, which is uh, the reason for that is that uh, all, all of the necessary design standards that you would need to build one of these things, if it's not more than three stories above grade plane, is included. Like you don't have to hire an architect or an engineer to do structural calculations because the International Residential Code says, OK, so if these walls are supporting two stories above them and a roof, you build them this way. You do uh, this many two by sixes on this kind of uh, this this many inches on center and you add this kind of wind bracing and you fasten it with these kind of fasteners and you got a house. Um, the idea being that you could just pick up the residential code and all of the structural engineering, the soil calculations, the, the climatic conditions that you would need, it's all in there for you. Um, because we're only talking about just these few buildings, it's done all of the math. And you just have to go in there and look at the table and say, I got a wall that's this big, it's holding this much stuff, and here's how to build it. And that's it. So it's nice that it provides all of those things. And it includes all of the things you're gonna have to think about. So fire, plumbing, mechanical, fuel, gas, electrical, um, is all included in the residential code. And you don't have to look at all those other codes like you would for something not within the residential code. Um, the IRC also includes accessory buildings like garages, uh, carports. Uh, if you have a, a detached uh, storage building or something, that all, that all is included in there. 
uh, and the energy code provisions. So there is the energy conservation code that has a residential and a commercial section. That residential section of the IECC is also included in the same of the chapter 11 of the international residential code. So that's one place where the code, code provisions are in both. You can look in the energy code or you can look in the energy chapter of the residential code and find everything you need for any kinds of these uh, structures. So that's the one that's a little different from the rest of the family, where they really try to put everything you would need in that one book, the IRC, for a single family home, for duplexes, or for townhouses. So that's a good one to know. Uh, number eight. Number eight is that uh, the codes, the life safety codes, have their own vocabulary. Uh, building codes, just like uh, just like the zoning code, the subdivision ordinance. Um, terms here are used that you're not going to find anywhere else, or they're used differently than in other places. So it's good to be familiar with uh, some of the uh, words that uh, and how they're used when we're talking about building codes rather than zoning districts rather than subdivisions, rather than uh, if any people work over in economic development uh, type of uh, world, uh, all of those same terms that we might use. We might use the same word in all of these different things, uh, different uh, contexts, and they have different meanings. So let's talk a little bit about this. So uh, one of the definitions that I'd like to uh, highlight is this one uh, from the building code, the definition of a dwelling, any building that contains one or two dwelling units used, intended, or designed to be used, rented, leased, uh, let out, or hired to be occupied, or that are occupied for living purposes. So that's, that's a dwelling. But notice that this talks about a building that contains one or two dwelling units. Um, in, uh, in zoning language, in planning terms, um, oftentimes single family and two family or duplex residential zones are very different. And there are zones that are single family only, and there are zones where duplexes and single family might be allowed. Like in your, zone, in your zoning ordinance, you might have those, and they're very distinct. The building code doesn't really make that kind of distinction between them. If you're throwing around the word dwelling within the building code, you could be either talking about a single dwelling, a single family dwelling, which is one dwelling unit in one building, or you could be talking about a duplex kind of situation where you have two separate independent units in one building. So that's just, again, a, def a, a difference there between zoning language, where oftentimes we think about single units and duplex units very, very differently in the building code. The difference is not so great. Uh, and if you're talking about dwellings, you're really talking about a building, not necessarily how many independent dwelling units, how many households might be in that building. So if we say, oh, this uh, this area, these couple of blocks have, uh, have, have 10 dwellings, well, under the building code, that might mean e each one could either be a single family home or a two family home. You don't know. Within zoning, we would probably say those are independent those are 10 household units or uh, 10 probably single family detached kind of units, we would use the term dwelling like that. So that's a good one to know whether you're talking planning and zoning or whether you're talking building inspections. And note here that the word duplex isn't used in the code. Uh, a, 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 uh, we, we talk about one single family dwellings and two family dwellings, but duplex is kind of a term of of uh, development, zoning, land use, real estate that doesn't really appear in the building code. The building code is going to talk about two family dwellings. And within the building code, a two family dwelling could either be what most people commonly refer to a duplex, one building with two dwelling units inside it that's all on one lot. So you go to the property, go to the parcel map. This is one, one piece of property owned by one individual uh, or company or whatever with two separate dwelling units uh, on that one property at that, that one parcel ID number, if you will. So that would be a duplex kind of situation. But for the building code, they would treat that just the same as single family attached, like within the, with the, the zoning ordinance might call single family attached, where you have one building that spans over a property line, you have one unit on each side, and that building se is separated on two different lots. So in that case, you might have both units be owner occupied uh, in a single family attached kind of situation. Um, so each, each uh, occupant of each one owns the land underneath uh, their unit and a little bit of the lot around it. 
So for uh, the zoning ordinance, it might treat single or a subdivision ordinance. It might treat single family attached and duplex very, very differently for where you're drawing the property lines, how many, uh, how many uh, units are owner occupied or renter occupied. So zoning subdivision wise, single family attached and duplex are very different for the building code. It's all the same. It doesn't really matter. That invisible property line down the middle of the building doesn't make a difference. Whether it's one building on one lot or one building on two lots, the building code does not make a distinction between those. So I am sometimes careful when people throw around words uh, like duplex, single family attached, and uh, two family this or that, um, exactly what we're talking about, because um, it, it doesn't always convey, uh, the, the words we use sometimes don't always convey um, how those things are arranged. Another definition, uh, a couple of terms that are used differently in different contexts between planning and zoning and the building code world. So in, in building code world, commercial is referring to anything that's built outside of the scope of the International Residential Code. We talked about back in, the, in number nine, where we're talking about single family homes, two family homes and townhouses. Anything else would be considered commercial within the building code world. So that includes a lot of things. Let's go here through this. So um, anything that you're gonna, uh, any, any kind of use um, that you're gonna have. So like, just like uh, on the uh, zoning ordinance, you're gonna have permitted uses, special uses within each zoning district. Well, within the building code world, we have these codes for basically all the uses. And this isn't all of them, but it's, pretty, but it's a, a good cross section of most of the ones you're probably gonna come up with. So we have B uses and M uses and E uses and things like that. B is for businesses, generally what you would consider in a zoning ordinance offices. Um, we call retail uses M, mercantile. Um, industrial uses are F uses, factory, there's low impact and high impact. Um, assembly, where you have a large group of people all together, that includes churches, it includes restaurants, it includes stadiums, uh, grandstands at uh, sports stadiums or athletic facilities. Um, e, education is only for schools up to the 12th grade, so we're dealing with essentially minors, um, and when you get into like uh, educational uses for adults, then those fall under I uses, either, either they're either businesses, uh, B, uh, or they might be I uses. I uses institutional can include things like nursing homes, hospitals, correctional facilities. Um, there's storage within uh, the building code for warehouses and garage and residential uses. So if you're building a hotel, uh, a dormitory, uh, an apartment building, those would all be considered our residential uses but they're considered commercial construction because they're not built within the scope of the residential code. So these terms get a little squirrely when you try to think about, I'm building, it, it's, it's residential on the zoning ordinance because I'm building apartments, but when I go over to building code land and I start talking about this, it's commercial construction because for an apartment building, you're gonna have to hire architects, engineers, and do structural calculations and do a, a much more complex, uh, design and set of codes that you're going to have to meet than if you were doing a single family house. So um, sometimes the the I've, I've gotten mixed up a few times between talking in planning zoning world about residential development and building code world about residential development or residential construction. Um, and for economic development purposes too, again, the building code is going to think about all of these things as commercial, but if you're dealing with economic development and you're talking about commercial uses, you're probably talking about things that uh, are businesses, uh, hopefully, you know, properties uh, that are paying property taxes, they're paying sale, they're generating sales taxes, they may need a business license, um, they have, you know, em employees, um, that kind of thing, or they're large employers, that's the things you would want for economic development. But with the building code world, we would consider churches, nonprofit hospitals, public schools, all of those would be commercial construction, but obviously churches, nonprofits, public schools aren't going to pay property taxes, sales taxes, um, and those kinds of things. So you also have to translate between if you're talking about economic indicators of commercial activity uh, or, or uh, commercial, uh, you know, private transactions or paying taxes or something like that. Commercial means very different in economic development than it does within the building code. 
So if this is commercial, then what's residential? Well, residential is anything within building code within building code land that falls within the international residential code, which includes the things we've talked about, single family detached, duplexes, townhouses, but it can also include things like a small bed and breakfast. If you have a small bed and breakfast or a lodging house that has fewer than five guest rooms um, and is owner occupied, that would fall under the international residential code, even though it's a business and they're probably paying hotel motel tax. They would need a business license. Um, they might have employees that uh, you know that uh, uh, work there that don't don't live there. Um, and so it, it's a business in a residential zone or in a residential structure. But within the within the uh, building code land, we would consider that all residential uh, construction. Residential within the IRC can also include care facilities like group homes, um, halfway houses, something like that where somebody's being supervised or they're getting assistance um, inside a house. Um, that would be a residential activity or a residential use and you could construct, you could build small ones of those within the IRC rather than going to the commercial codes. Um, temporary rentals, so Airbnbs, Verbos, something like that would fall under the IRC. Um, and so uh, the building code requirements aren't necessarily what you would find uh, for uh, like a hotel or a motel. Those can fall under the IRC if they're small enough. And even just for owner occupied, single family detached housing, um, accessory structures fall within the IRC. So garages, workshops, uh, your she sheds, your man caves, your uh, swimming pools, your decks, your outdoor kitchens. So some of those, depending on how large a house and how large a property somebody has, those could be significant. They could be big, they could be tall, they could generate noise, they could, uh, you know, change how the water flows off the backyard into the receiving stream or onto a neighbor's property or visually what the neighborhood looks like if somebody builds an enormous, uh, you know, accessory structure. Um, so those things are, uh, if it's a, you know, a, a six car garage, it would be an accessory, it, that's an accessory structure to a house. Um, it's not like building a commercial building, it's going to fall within the IRC for uh, commercial for uh, building code world. So residential and commercial mean different things in building code land than they do in in zoning land. Um, and sometimes I, I kind of it's just important to remember who you're talking to or what what the context of using those terms are. Okay, let's go on here. Number seven. So the building code is barely a passing grade. Um, so this is uh, I, I use this to kind of push back on people who think, oh, you know, it's so burdensome, it's so difficult, it's so, uh, it's an impossibly high standard. Um, it's really not trying to be an impossibly high standard. Um, and it's written right into the very preamble of the building codes that they are, they are intended to be the minimum standard for reason, for a reasonable level of safety to the occupants of the structure, to the property itself, and to the first responders, the firefighters, the EMS, the police who need to go in there and operate uh, under emergency conditions. Um, and this is something I've seen at the building code hearings when we're talking about, uh, you know, sh should we change this part of the building code to be uh, different or more strict or whatever. Um, the codes themselves are really trying to be just a minimum standard. And it does not mean that somebody can't obviously exceed that to have extra safety, um, you know, for these kinds of facilities uh, for your own home or, or whatever it is. Like it is set to be the minimum standard that uh, the people writing the building code, and we'll get to that in the future here at a couple of slides, but um, are it's intended to be like just passing uh, grade, you know, a C minus, you're, you're not failing, you're just hitting the minimums to be uh, safe and to just generally have people occupy it and use it what it's for. So people give me grief sometimes about well, why do I have to do this? This is as low as we can set the bar and let people, you know, live here, eat here, sleep here, uh, do whatever they're going to do in these buildings. And that firefighters who, when there's a call and it's go into this building and, and save it, save people, whatever, they know what to expect when they go in there. So it is intentionally set to be the minimum standard. Uh, but like a good comprehensive plan, um, the building codes should be 
decision-making tools. They should be decision-making guides. I really try to think about them like this, um, that uh, when, when I get a call or when I'm out on a job site and people are like, well, I'm, I'm, you know, I, I've got, I, I, can I do this? Can I do that? Which of these two should I do? Um, open up the building code, just like I would open up the zoning ordinance if somebody's asking me that or an alcohol permit or whatever the regulations are, signs or something else. Well, hopefully it's directing you to do this and not that, you know, like when, or, or at least do this much and then anything else is, is optional. So if you're, uh, reading it right, if you're applying it right, it should hopefully, instead of be adding confusion to the situation, it should be making things clearer. That's a standard I use when I'm planning on the subdivision ordinance, the zoning ordinance, uh, the comprehensive plan. Um, if it's doing its job and, and if, 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 if it's doing a good job for us, it's hopefully adding more clarity and less obscurity. The building codes should be the same way. They should be guiding you through uh, the uh, unknowns into, uh, into a minimum standard of safety. And if it's not, then we either need to rewrite it or make some change to it or change how we're applying it or something. But it's it's intended to make those situations where you go, I'm not sure what to do. Let me consult the code. It should be helping you make those decisions, not getting in your way of creating a safe outcome. So good way to think about uh, the codes. Number six is proportional, proportionality within the building codes. Um, and this is one that I had to learn that like you look at the building codes sitting on someone's shelf and they're huge, just thousands and thousands of pages on plumbing and fire and mechanical and, and energy conservation. It's just, it seems like why it, there's just so much verbiage and so many strict requirements and all this, like why, how, why it's, it's ridiculous. But in reality, not all of that applies to every situation. So let's talk a little bit about um, how the building codes, the life safety codes apply different standards to different things and why they do that. And this was really an ins a powerful insight for me as a planner when I started thinking about uh, the difference between land use planning from a comprehensive plan point of view and, and how those uses relate to um, their, their adjacent neighbors and to districts and to uh, a whole community and how uses are looked at by building code officials and fire marshals and things like that. So there's a spectrum of uses uh, within the code. And we talked about that, gave some examples there. Um, and then there are threat levels associated with them. Um, and so they're roughly categorized into kind of a low, moderate, high. These aren't official categories, but think about this as a, being a spectrum of how dangerous is this building and to the people that are inside it, uh, to the first responders and things like that. So uh, obviously the more dangerous you are, the more the code is going to make you do to protect the people and property involved, the less dangerous there's the less there is. You might think that, uh, oh, single family homes are probably a really low risk. Uh, you know, what, what could be safer than, you know, just a single family home sitting on somebody's lot, but it's actually not. It actually falls right in the middle. In terms of the building code, if you wanted to pick the use that has the fewest restrictions on it in the building code, that it's going to make you do almost nothing to protect the people inside, you're looking at a B use, business uses like an office use, and then a little bit more strict would be like a retail use that we would call M or mercantile. And and then the, the factors that make those uses less dangerous are the fact that the, the occupants of those uh, uses are generally alert. They're awake, hopefully, while they're at their workplace uh, or while they're shopping. Um, they're alert to the environment around them. So if there's a problem in the building, someone's going to notice it and say, hey, the building is on fire or there's smoke or danger and we need to leave. People are going to notice a danger. 
Um, most people in those kinds of situations are going to be capable of self-rescue. They got themselves in that building. They're probably able to get themselves out of the building. So we don't have a situation where uh, firefighters, emergency responders have to go in or something because people are trapped and they can't get out. Uh, most people are going to be in a condition where they can self-rescue. And most of the time, offices, retail kind of uses aren't terribly crowded in terms of the relationship of people to stuff, to exits. There's plenty of ways in and out. Like It's not like we have a whole lot of people with very few exits. The early uh, disasters that you might uh, read about in history from building code problems where some factory or movie theater caught fire and hundreds of people died is exactly that reason that there was a whole lot of people inside this building and not enough exits to get everybody out as fast as this fire would spread and you have hundreds of people dying in the building at once um, so these kinds of uses just aren't really uh, very strict in terms of the building code you get a little more moderate when you start thinking about residential uses all residential uses whether it's single family or multifamily or anything else as well as educational uses i kind of put in this model group category because you have people who are sleeping so they're not alert they don't know that um, the kitchen's on fire and you're upstairs in your bedroom. That's why we have smoke alarms. Uh, that's why we have carbon monoxide alarms to tell you, hey, you may not know that there's a fire in the basement and you need, or in another one of the bedrooms or in another part of the house. So it's alerting you to a danger there um, that you're not going to notice because you're asleep. Um, you might have people um, in residential situations or in educational situations who are not capable of, of self-rescue, they're children, they're uh, impaired in some way, um, and they're not capable of getting themselves out of uh, the bedroom they're in or the room they're in. So they either need assistance from somebody else already in it or they need first responders or something. So you get a little more risk factor when you think about residential and, and, edu residential and educational uses. And then your high risk stuff is things where you've got uh, what we call assembly uses, institutional uses, and certainly high hazard uh, uh, uses. Um, hazards makes sense that you've got something in there that's going to burn, it's going to explode, it's toxic, um, it's going to it's going to knock people out, it's going to make people sick. Obviously, there's just a substance or conditions in there that could be life threatening uh, very quickly and could uh, mobilize people or just just flat out kill them and destroy the structure. So when you get into hazard stuff, that's pretty obvious. But assembly uses, you may have a, a lot of people all in one space, and now you have to think about those emergency exits, uh, exit plans, lighting, um, things like that to get a lot of people out of a space very quickly. Um, and we can kind of see that, but that's also uh, not necessarily necessarily we, we uh, you know a, a large a large gathering uh, makes sense but even uh, where you might have a small uh, restaurant or a nightclub or a bar well now you've got people who are presumably consuming alcohol um, it may be dark uh, because of the lighting for the theater or uh, the, the dance floor. Um, so you may not be able to uh, see where the exits are. Um, you may not be able to tell the difference between the, uh, you know, the, the, the smoke and decorations for uh, an event and something that's actually a threat. So um, you may not know what the dangers are around you. Um, in those kinds of spaces, or you may not be able to uh, to rescue yourself. Institutional uses, so if we're getting to hospitals or nursing homes or something where people are sedated, uh, they're uh, not, uh, they're impaired, uh, their mobility is impaired. Um, you can't, you know, get yourself out of your own uh, hospital room to another place. So that's why we have uh, codes are very different for these kinds of things because you have people who can't rescue themselves out of a dangerous situation. They either need the building to do it for them, they need uh, employees to do it for them, uh, they need care caregivers to do it for them, they need uh, emergency responders to do it for them. Um, so then the code restrictions get a lot more strict. Uh, so if you if you're uh, have someone come to you and they either have a mix of uses. Uh, that they're doing, um, or they've got some kind of activity and you're not quite sure where, where it falls into any of these kinds of things uh, on the right, on the high side, 
if you're thinking, well, okay, people might not be alert, people might not be capable of rescuing themselves in this situation, or you might have a situation uh, expected to, I mean, obviously, you can always have some kind of odd situation that would happen where lots of people were in a building unexpectedly. But if you expect a lot of people to be there at times, then you need to have, uh, you know, exits that can accommodate that kind of people or alarms and things like that. So this is the spectrum that I think about as a building code official of danger to the occupants, danger to first responders. Um, and it isn't necessarily low impact development and high impact development by any other standard like land uses or property taxes or anything else. It's kind of its own spectrum of things that, um, that, that we need to think about in terms of protecting people that's different than you would think about in terms of uses within a zoning district uh, or something like that. So it's a little different uh, way of thinking about these things. Uh, so one of the things, though, that we oftentimes run into that I've had with this is, you know, well, then we say, uh, you know, somebody wants to do a, a building and the, the, the building code says, well, it, it, if you're doing this kind of use, it can be this many square feet or this many stories or whatever. And there's a limit on it. But the building code then also says there are ways to get beyond those limits to have larger buildings than this this part of the code allows. One of them on the left that you'll see uh, is uh, fire barriers. So you can create a barrier between uh, inside a building to separate it out into two separate fire areas. Um, and so for like planning purposes or for tax assessment purposes, you might say, well, that's all one big building because you just count the perimeter walls. Um, and so for, you know, square feet of uh, industrial or retail construction or something like that, you would say that's just one big building. But for building code purposes, that's really two buildings. We would consider fire area one and fire area two as if they were two separate buildings that just shared a common wall between them because that fire barrier, maybe it's a one hour or a two hour firewall, really allows the two buildings to be independent. One could be on fire, one could be completely demolished, and the other one hasn't been threatened yet. Um, by the time that people respond and are able to control the fire on the other side. So um, again, what, what we think about for planning and zoning uh, as one building over here for fire protection purposes and for uh, building code compliance, we would actually think about it as two buildings inside kind of one overall larger skin. Um, another one that oftentimes comes up uh, that I hear from planning in the planning and zoning world all the time, pretty simple sprinklers. Uh, if you're going to sprinkler a building, then you can go much more people, much larger size because the automatic fire sprinklers will make the building survivable for longer. Um, and that's just a, a key thing. When we think about how quickly can you exit a lot of people from a building? Well, if you can make that building habitable longer after the fire starts, then you can have more time to get everyone out. Um, the sprinklers are containing or perhaps extinguishing the fire before first responders even show up. So fire sprinklers are really kind of magic in, in building codes a lot. Like a sprinkler building is very different from a non-sprinkler building in terms of what you can do inside of it or how large it can be, because obviously it's going to go in and start uh, fighting that fire before uh, before very many people have gotten out and before first responders can get there. So uh, if you, you run into that kind of stuff, well, you could sprinkler it and that would give you a whole lot more opportunity to do stuff in the building than you could if it was not sprinkler. Number five, flexibility. So uh, I, I just always thought when I was just doing city planning that, that the building code just says, this is it. You know, the, the building code works in one way. It's like this. As long as everything's exactly the way I want, I'm totally flexible. Like the building code just, this is what you have to do. You have to do it this way because the building code says so. And that's not really the case so much. It's a little bit more like this, um, where uh, there is built into the building code uh, uh, a, a, a get out of jail free card kind of thing, or like, no, we understand that the building code isn't going to perfectly predict what to do in every situation. It's uh, it's a bunch of words sitting in a book on someone's shelf. It doesn't exist in the real world. Just like your zoning ordinance or your subdivision ordinance has uh, opportunities for 
uh, variances for special exceptions, uh, even, you know, rezonings, text amendments, something like that, map amendments, where you say, you know, obviously this doesn't work in this case and we need to find, find some alternative. Those are options in the building code too. So let's talk about some of that. Um, there are two big ones within the building code um, that I want to highlight for you because I know I've been frustrated as a planner. I'm working with somebody and they got this property and that building and they're trying to put this use in it. And you're trying to come up with something maybe a little creative, a little out of the box. Um, and you think, well, this, this could be a right opportunity for this neighborhood or, or this uh, for your community it could be an asset. But, you know, then you run into smack into the building code and the building code says, nope, can't do this. Or that does that just seems weird. And we don't allow weird. Well, the building code does actually a little bit. Modifications is one part and it's listed in section 104.10. So the magic words for modifications are practical difficulties. This really comes into a place where either you have a site that has a constraint on it of some kind, uh, meaning it, it's uh, conditions just you know don't give you some other alternative, or you're maybe dealing with an existing building that is was built for to be one thing, now you're turning it into something else. So you have practical difficulties of dealing with this. But if you can come up with an, a, a modification that doesn't lessen the uh, job of the building code, the building code is trying to provide a minimum standard of health, accessibility, life safety, of structural strength, it's trying to protect people inside. And if you can say, look, to meet the strict terms of the building code, we would have to tear down this wall and then rebuild it one foot over. You know, it would just seem like an incredible waste of effort to, you know, completely redo this entire element of the building to gain 12 inches of space on one side or another, or to uh, widen out this, this, you know, feature or something. Like the, the strict terms of the building code would have us spend lots and lots of money and lots and lots of time to to do this and we wouldn't really gain any safety it's not any safer it's not any healthier it's just it doesn't make sense well you can do that you can say that there's a practical difficulty in meeting the strict terms of the code but it's still just as safe as it would be or reasonably safe then the building official can approve that that's fine and your local building official is the one who does that so the building official is charged with taking that building code that's written to apply to all kinds of circumstances all across the united states and even beyond um, into you know your jurisdiction and you, and building x on property y they have the ability to they should hopefully they have the power to go in there and say yeah that doesn't make sense like why would we spend all of this money and all of this time and make this huge change of this building to not really gain anything. If people are going to be reasonably safe inside, then we can approve that. And that's a modification. So it's kind of like a variance in that there's some reason why I just can't meet the strict terms of the code, but we need to be able to reuse this building or use this property or whatever. It would seem like a waste to just, well, we're just going to let this empty building sit there then because we can't meet some incredibly strict standard for no good reason. No approve a modification and work work around to provide the safety you need and then move forward with the project. So that's a modification. An alternative though is a little different. This is from section 104.11, but it says that the building codes don't specifically prohibit any material, any design or any construction method. And that blew my mind when I read that in sentence in the building code the first time I was like, wait a minute, the whole point of the building code is to tell me do this, don't do that. And here you're saying you don't prohibit anything. Well, yeah, it actually <laughs> says this. And the idea being that the building code is obsolete by the time you write it down. Um, and certainly, you know, like I'm currently working in Swansea off the 2015 building codes were written seven years ago. And the world's a little different now than it was seven years ago. So um, it, it allows the building official to say, hey, if you've got a material that's not described, not listed, a, a design, some method of construction that's innovative, I've never seen it before. Maybe this is the first one in the community, first one in the state, first one in the world. Um, but you can document and show that it makes sense. It would work. Here's engineer statements. Here's testing reports. Here's things that show that this could work. The building official can approve that. It doesn't, doesn't tie their hands and say, nope, nope, no. Nope. Everything's got to be the same 
cookie cutter, uh, off the shelf uh, designs that every other community gets. You can, within the building code, have innovation in materials and designs and construction method. That's okay, as long as you can document that it meets the spirit of the code and it still is keeping people relatively safe. So those are alternatives if you have some kind of innovative feature that you want to include uh, in a neighborhood or in a project. The building code doesn't necessarily um, restrict you to just doing conventional construction and making every community look like every other community. Um, there is also within the building code a board of appeals. It's kind of like the zoning board of appeals. Um, but uh, it, I've never had to use one in all these years of, of doing this. You know, they can appeal your decision if they think you're interpreting the code wrong or applying it wrong, but it specifically states in the code they cannot waive code requirements. So everybody says, well, I'm just going to take this to the city council or I'm going to take this to the board and, uh, you know, the, the city can't make me do this or that. Yeah, they can. Uh, the board cannot just waive a requirement. Now, again, you can do a modification, you can do an alternative, but the requirements of the code specifically state you cannot waive them. You can find a different way to do them, but you cannot waive them within the code. And I've had some people kind of, oh, you know, I, I know all these important, powerful people in town. I can get this waived. No, not really. You really can't. So, OK, number four, arcane terms. Oh, this is a good one. So just like the zoning ordinance, the subdivision ordinance, and you, you talk to someone who doesn't know what city planning is or uh, what, a, what the difference is between a major plat and a minor plat or something else, and you know their eyes just glaze over and they have no idea what you're talking about. Yeah, the building code has this kind of stuff too. So you know, understood by few, mysterious and secret. Um, and sometimes I like to think that um, you know we we keep our own little uh, uh, jargon to ourselves sometimes, so we have inside jokes and things. And, and the building code officials uh, and building inspectors certainly do uh, as well. So I'll clue you in on a little bit of this. One of the ones that struck me that I had to learn uh, is, is different from the way I used to think about it is this one, fire separation distance. So this is a, a distance measured from the face of a building out to one of three things. It's either to an interior lot line, either to the center line of a street, an alley, or a public way, or to an imaginary line between two buildings. So let's talk about, let's go through all these real quick. Actually, the first one's pretty simple. The closest interior lot line, pretty simple. It's the distance between the building and the property line, done. Uh, the distance to the, to the second one's a little different than zoning setbacks because usually you measure zoning setbacks you know, from a property line out into the property uh, away from the street. For that, uh, the, the property line between the building, the lot the building is on and the street doesn't really matter. For fire separation distance, you could go all the way to the center line of the street or the right of way uh, instead of just to the property line. So for fire separation distance, you don't, from the, let's say the front of a building uh, out to the street that it faces, you don't stop at the property line. You can actually go out and split that street right of way uh, to uh, go to the middle. And then at that point, you then count the fire separation distance to the other side of the street and to the building facing it. So for fire separation distance purposes, you ignore that property line between the, the lot and the street and you just go all the way out to the center line of the street. The other one that's kind of weird is this imaginary line between two buildings on the same lot. Um, when I'm dealing with zoning setbacks, you generally deal with here are the property lines and you have an area around each property line that you can't build on or do whatever on. Um, but it's kind of weird to think about, wait, what's this line on the same property between two buildings? So it looks something like this, where you have building one and building two, um, they're all on the same property, but for code purposes, we have to know how far apart are these buildings, how much, what's the likelihood of a fire in B1 jumping to B2, and this, these, this separation between the two, you could just draw an imaginary line between them and say, okay, this building one gets this distance and this building two gets this distance. And then we can tell as if they had a property line between them, what's the likelihood of fire going from one to the other. And there's no requirement that you have to split this evenly. This graphic has it this way, but it very well could be you could say building one has 
10 feet and building uh, of a fire separation distance and building two has 40. If there's 50 feet between these buildings, you can separate it out 10 for one and 40 for the other. And that's just fine. And then if you want to change it later, it's imaginary. You can just change it to something else. And as long as it still meets the building code, it's fine. So it's an imaginary line between two buildings on the same property. And it's kind of weird. We just don't really have that in uh, zoning ordinances and stuff like that. So let's give it a little bit of an example too here. So again, these are just standard building setbacks. We've got a, a single family house here on a lot on cul-de-sac. Um, so we've got this unusual kind of Pentagon shape for the property and the setbacks you just measure off of the property lines and go in. So you get these kinds of zoning setbacks, front yard, rear yard, side yard, all that good kind of stuff. But fire separation distances are always measured to the right angle of the exterior walls. So for this kind of a house, um, you've got this L-shaped house on this Pentagon-shaped lot. You're going to have these fire separation distances at right angles. So you can see they don't really match up with zoning setbacks at all. Um, so for the, the plan reviewer looking at this building, uh, trying to compare, well, how close, how likely is a fire at this building going to jump over here to a building on another lot? These are the things they're thinking about, these fire separation distances, not the zoning setbacks. So um, sometimes they, they all work together, but sometimes they don't. So let's talk about this too, where it's different for fire separation distances. There aren't any minimums. You know, the zoning ordinance would say, you know, you have a, a 25 foot front yard and an eight foot side yard. And that's it. That's a, that's a minimum zoning setback. So fire separation distances don't work like that in the building codes. You can see here, this is a table for residential structures for the exterior walls. Um, the minimum fire separation distance up in the top right hand corner here, zero feet. You don't even have to have one. It can be zero. You could have the, the wall of this house right on the property line if you can make it a one hour firewall. That's the minimum resistance rating. Once you get to five feet or greater, now you can drop that and it can just be a regular construction. And this makes sense in the fact that if you have five feet on one side of this fire separation distance line, you have five feet for the building on the other side of the line, you've got 10 feet from building to building, and that's the separation. If you're going to have less than 10 feet, well, now you're going to have to have something done. So uh, that's kind of a, a good standard that I always try to think about uh, planning and zoning. Anytime, property line or not, you get two buildings 10 feet or closer together, uh, start thinking about these kinds of things because, well, one of these two buildings is going to have to have a one-hour firewall. Um, also note down here on openings and walls, um, if you have a fire separation distance of less than three feet, you're not going to have any doors or windows. Um, if you have it at three feet to five feet, you're going to have no more than 25% of the wall have doors or windows. Once you get beyond five feet, you can have openings all you want. So doors and windows and stuff. So for new urbanist kind of things, mixed uses, um, any kind of situation where you've got two buildings in proximity to each other. Um, again, my, my rule is 10 feet. Uh, I start thinking about these things and definitely less than five feet uh, or some kind of common wall or a narrow space or something, you may have to have just very few doors or windows or none. Um, so that's kind of how that works, that while we think about these fire separation distances, um, there's no minimum in the code, unlike the zoning ordinance. Okay, number three, the building code is free. Free stuff is my favorite. So one of the things that we uh, uh, that's different with the building code than the zoning ordinances and stuff is that the building code is copyright protected. It is owned by the International Code Council, and they are funded by selling the codes. They write the codes. They copyright them, and then when you when when I buy a copy of the code, that is how ICC is funded. It's not a government agency. It's not funded by donations from uh, trade groups and uh, lobbying efforts. It's totally independent financially, so it's able to create. They, these are the standards that we think are best, uh, and you know that's that's how they're funded. But they're also laws. So you know, it's like your zoning ordinance, your subdivision ordinance. It's available online if somebody walks in and they says, I want a copy of the zoning ordinance or this section of the zoning ordinance, you give it to them. It's Freedom of Information Act. It's, it's a public law. So how do we resolve the fact that both of this is copyright and it's their intellectual property, but it's also the law of your city or your county or your state? 
So what they did, and this was the outcome of this uh, Supreme Court case, Beck versus Southern Building Code Congress International, is that they make the building codes available online. This is the website, codes.iccsafe.org slash public, so that anyone can go there and read them. It's on their on their website, um, and you can go there and read them, but they're protected in that you can't like copy them um, and uh, reuse them for your own purposes. They are still copyright protected. Um, so uh, if anyone is like, well, where does it say this or that in the building code? Or how do I know what the building code says? Um, you can go here and click on it, find the building code that you're looking for and read it for free, absolutely free, but it's still protected by copyright by ICC. And that is how they are funded and maintain their independence. So if you go to that codes.iccsafe.org, it kind of looks like this. Um, you see, you can look up I codes, you can look up locations. So if you just know uh, this jurisdiction or this city, it'll tell you what uh, building codes you're in, probably, but always double check the local officials. Um, like when I logged in and it says, uh, it knows I'm logging in for work. So it says, here are popular codes from Illinois and it gives me the codes I'm looking for. There's also a premium version that uh, like I subscribe to uh, here at work so that you can do search uh, of it. You can put notes in, you can get all the updates and current and stuff. Um, so there is a, a, a paid access version that gives you more features features, but if you just want to read the text of the code itself, it's all available on there for free. Okay, we're getting to the end here. Number two, uh, crowdsourced. Uh, the building code is crowdsourced. It is uh, not written by any one person or group that knows everything. It's not like, oh, we know we're, we're the super smart people and we know what everybody else should be doing. Um, it's not that kind of a situation. Um, it is built uh, and written by a, a diverse group of people through an inclusive process. Um, and so kind of like, uh, you know, when you go through a, a zoning change and you have a public hearing before you put anything in place for a text amendment or a map amendment, you have to have a public hearing. What does everyone think of this? And then it gets adopted or rejected or whatever. Um, same kind of thing for the uh, building codes. Uh, it is an open process that ICC operates. There's no cost to participate in it. And anyone can submit a proposal to change the building code to be a different way or to make a comment on somebody else's proposals, except the people who actually work at the International Code Council. They are the only people in the world prohibited from either suggesting a change or uh, making a public comment about one. There are committees that review each different parts of the code, fire and gas and plumbing and mechanical, um, and they review all of those decisions. There's an open hearing process to go through and review them. Um, and then uh, ultimately at the end of the process, um, it is the uh, government uh, officials, somebody like me, who's charged with enforcing the codes in my jurisdiction, I get to vote on what the actual changes are. So all of the other people who get to comment, like the Air Conditioning Contractors Association or the Concrete American Concrete Institute or the American Wood Council, like they can provide expertise and they can propose changes, but ultimately what the content of the code is, is determined by the voting members who represent government agencies who actually have hopefully no interest other than public safety uh, at their motivation of how they're going to vote to do this. So it can't be just, uh, well, this is written this way so that uh, the uh, Air Conditioning Contractors Association can make a lot of money. Like, no, that doesn't work because they don't get to vote on the changes. Only the people who are either government employees or working on behalf of a local government to actually enforce the code get the ultimate vote to say what it is. But that big group that is included in making public comments and stuff can include all kinds of people, architects, engineers, designers, the trade associations that I talked about, and it includes psychologists, it includes public health experts, that's really become even more important as we've gone through the uh, pandemic, um, law enforcement experts, um, uh, and, uh, you know, zoologists, when you're dealing with like the wildlife land urban interface code, um, we're dealing with protection from insects. Um, there's all kinds of stuff where uh, some group or some person with expertise in something that is relevant comes in. One of the things that we've learned uh, just in the past few code cycles um, is about psychology. I mentioned psychologists. So we found out that, um, you know, like in an assembly space, a movie theater or a church gathering or something like that, People oftentimes, or we have all of these emergency exits around people, but when it's time to leave, 
people don't go, where's the nearest emergency exit? They go out the way they came in. And so the psychology of how we get people to go out and exit that's not the one they came in is now thought about differently. We thought, well, people will just go to the nearest exit. Well, no, they just revert back to retracing their steps of how they got in, which may be longer than the nearest exit. So that's kind of different. Um, there's some thinking now about fire extinguishers in buildings. We want fire extinguishers in buildings. It makes sense. But oftentimes it's like, you know what? Don't stay. Let the professionals fight the fire. And the amateurs need to just leave. But if there's a fire extinguisher there, somebody thinks, oh, I can play Rambo. I can be the hero and use that fire extinguisher to deal with a situation that you might not be able to deal with. And so maybe it's better to just get out of the building and let the professionals deal with it. If, if they need to fight the fire in the building, they'll come in and do it. And maybe those kinds of things need rethinking. So um, that's where psychology comes into play in this kind of stuff. There's all kinds of different people who can get involved in this process. Um, and we do it every three years. The uh, codes are updated every three years. So 2015, 2018, 2021. Right now we're working on the 2024 code cycles. Um, as soon as we finish one, we go right into uh, amending it and uh, thinking about what, what's next for um, the new one. So it is a really big, complicated uh, process, but it's very inclusive. So um, that's a, a, a nice thing I like to think about the code. Um, and if somebody ever comes up and says, well, I think that's stupid. I think I know a better way that the, the building code should do this or that. Okay, great. Propose it. Th throw it out there. They have to listen to you. They have to consider it. And then let it go up to a vote and, um, and see what it is. And sometimes that's that's what happens is, uh, you know, people find from applying the code from a previous uh, ver the language from an earlier version, you go, you know, we could rewrite this and make it better, add clarity, add more options or something else. A lot of those things uh, make it through the process and go into the new codes. So it's constantly being changed and uh, amended and updated uh, by people who are actually using it. So it's a good thing about the code. Okay. Number one, I'll finish up here and then we'll have time for questions. Um, I have come to appreciate how much the life safety codes can be a part of a campaign for greater social justice. Um, and so if you think about, if you're someone who thinks about, you could look at the planning and zoning rules and subdivision and you're like, hopefully let's make communities healthier, make them more sustainable, you know, more, more people thriving and flourishing in the places that we're building and your zoning code, your transportation code, your transportation plans, um, your, your, uh, all of those things, your architectural standards, all of those things are going for that. Well, the building codes, life safety codes can be part of this um, change for social justice. So let's talk about some of those things. Um, like any, there's so many uh, parts to this, uh, and you think about it, it, it's almost the kind of thing that because we spend so much time in buildings, uh, our houses, our offices, our schools, um, our places of worship, whatever you do, if our buildings aren't reflecting our values or they aren't providing for greater social justice, then that's going to be a problem. How are we going to achieve those things in society without making our buildings better as well? So the building code needs to be an avenue for a greater social justice, for, for positive social change and it can be. Here are just some of the things that the building code touches. Accessibility, I think, is, is a good one. We just came up on 30 years of the Americans with Disability Act. So building codes being inclusive and uh, becoming more accessible to the disabled is clearly a benefit to society. And you couldn't achieve the level of accessibility that we have without including those things in the building codes. Um, it wouldn't be, you know, 30 years, if we hadn't done that with the ADA, uh, then it still wouldn't be implemented today. But hopefully every time we remodel a building, we build a new building, we just increase our level of accessibility. Um, inclusion of gender identities, we can think about how the plumbing code treats people uh, and provides facilities for people. Um, what, what, what does that mean to include? Um, we don't necessarily have the same, uh, you know, if, if we just kept the same uh, physical facilities that we had 30 years ago, 50 years ago, that doesn't necessarily work for a, 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 a more diverse population and a more inclusive society. So we may have to include in the codes standards for those kinds of things that are different than, uh, you know, so that the, the buildings reflect our 
thinking of those things and how we treat those issues of gender. Um, you may think gender building code, how does that work? But it's right in there. Um, so it's got to reflect what those are. Um, environmental justice. So there are things in the building code. And, you know, if we're going to, uh, you know, uh, instead of demolishing buildings, they can be deconstructed and used materials can be reused in a new structure. And that's specifically part of the uh, existing building code that uh, you do not have to have brand new materials. You can use salvage materials. You can use reclaimed materials. You can deconstruct a building rather than demolishing it just throwing it all in the landfill. You can take out the brick, the wood, the glass, and reuse it in another building. Um, and that's specifically included in the building code. So you can't use that as an excuse to say, well, I just have to throw all this stuff away. No, if you can salvage it, if it can still do its job and keep people safe, reuse it. Energy conservation is, of course, huge in the building code. Buildings use a ton of energy. So where we're getting it from, how efficiently we're using it is right in the building code. Historical and cultural preservation. Historic preservation, historic buildings are given deference in the building code. Um, new urbanist kind of spaces that, you know, we may think and conventional zoning ordinances don't allow this. Well, the building code can accommodate new urbanist and mixed use kinds of developments. Um, and a good application of the building code can have those kinds of developments that were kind of shied away from historically in the past because there was a danger. Well, now that they're maybe becoming more popular and more productive and more economically viable, the building code can accommodate those kinds of situations where I've got residential and commercial uses right next to each other. How do I protect people in those environments? You can do it um, in the building code. It is not a barrier to those things. Housing choices, we see demographic trends changing. People want uh, not just large houses on large lots. So the building code can accommodate those in those changing desires for smaller homes, for maintenance-free situations, um, safety from gun violence. It, it's not long ago that you could you could hear people talking about uh, a situation where there was a, a mass shooting. How did the building make a difference for uh, for what was happening there? Um, doors and windows and viewpoints and reinforced places. Um, it's going to be a part of dealing with gun violence is building codes and safety situations. Climate change certainly goes in there. Um, underserved and under-resourced communities. Um, the building code, if improperly applied, could be a barrier to going back into older neighborhoods, older communities, or uh, less resourced areas, less served. And it could be a barrier to those, or it could be something, if it's applied properly and creatively, to reuse what's there, take as much advantage of it as you can, and still provide a, a safety level that's acceptable. Um, it does not have to say, well, you know, it, it just doesn't make any sense to reinvest in these areas because the building code will make it too expensive. That's not necessarily true. The building code can be flexible and accommodating and encourage development in areas that wouldn't otherwise uh, wouldn't otherwise get it, or it can at least be a part of a strategy to go in and redevelop an area. Um, it can be a, an asset to your local economy. Um, you know, one of the things that you know we we obviously uh, get money from property taxes based on how things are valued, and if your buildings have more value um, because they're safer and they're more energy efficient and they're better constructed, then that goes into the property tax value and that goes right into the coffers of the local community. Um, so it's, it's uh, and, and, and your insurance rates that you're going to pay if you have this kind of building plan review and if you have this kind of fire response, um, then goes into the vitality of that community because it's safer, they're gonna pay lower insurance rates. Um, disaster resiliency, how, how does a building react to a power outage, to a flood, to a fire, to, uh, to earthquakes if you're in a seismic area? How many people are going to be displaced because their building becomes uninhabitable if we make those buildings more resistant 
then that's fewer people who need some place to stay and need a services because their home, their apartment building, whatever it is, is still able to care for them. How many uh, you know, hospitals and fire stations and critical facilities are more resilient now because the building codes have said you need to be up and operating even in case of a disaster so that these people can do their job. So if we see increasing risk of of large scale disasters from climate change and just life, then we have to have facilities uh, every time we make a building safer and more resistant to that kind of, of disaster that's saving someone's life, that's making the uh, economic recovery after that disaster easier. So those benefits just spill out over time a lot. So it's really hard to think about any of these social justice causes that you you might encounter and think it doesn't somewhere intersect with the building code and you can use uh, a, a well-written building code and a well-applied building code to further any of these goals, whether we're talking about people or the environment or the economy or something else, hopefully your building code is is getting you closer to those goals and not further away. Um, and so it isn't just a technical manual of build this so the building won't fall down. You can achieve larger goals for your community with what you do with your building code. Um, and I didn't really appreciate that before as a planner. I was like, well, we need inclusive zoning. We need new urbanists. We need to encourage these other things. But the building code has to can and has to go along with those things if you're really going to achieve those goals in the real world. Um, so think about those kinds of things. Anytime you deal with a larger goal like that, is the building code helping me to do those things in my community as it changes over time? So those are my top tens of all of that. I see we got a couple of questions, but uh, I really appreciate everybody uh, listening to me just rant on and on about this. The building code is something I've learned to be passionate about. Um, and I got my contact information back up there. I'd love to connect with anybody about this. Um, and uh, yeah, we can go through questions if anybody has. Sure. Thanks, Joe. That was really interesting and informative. I don't think I've ever sat through such an engaging um, learning opportunity on the building code. So we do have several questions. I'll start with James, uh, who asked, what countries participate in follow the international building code? So right now, um, the uh, the international code is um, it, it's growing out of the United States into the Caribbean and the Middle East. Um, it's it's areas that um, uh, ICC has kind of reached out to and spread um, the code that way. Um, it, it's uh, There's new construction going on there that's most similar to the United States. So that's where we see more application of it. The name is a bit of a misnomer. It was a combination of there were regional codes back before um, in the in the 20th century. There was the Southern Building Code. There was the Uniform Building Code. There was um, the uh, so there, there were separate codes in three different regions of the country. And then they all decided this is silly. We just need one code. But there was already something called the National Building Code. So they didn't want to use that name again. And they did want to think about the fact that if these standards make sense, then it really should be something that is applied beyond the United States. So they started calling them all the international codes. Um, but really, they're based in Birmingham, Alabama, and they were built out of these, these individual regional codes that were built in the United States. And they adopted that international uh, marker uh, for that, but uh, really homegrown right, right here in the United States. All right, thanks. And uh, Jonathan asks, so I can see you've inspired Jonathan. He wants to know, can you briefly explain the pro process to become CBO certified, how long it took, how many exams, etc.? Sure. So I had to do, uh, when, when I did it, there were two exams I had to take. Uh, one is the legal management module, which is kind of understanding all the, oh, the Fourth Amendment search and seizure stuff and the, the constitutional background and uh, that kind of stuff from, uh, from the, the legal side of enforcing any kind of code. And that was fairly easy for me um, because I'd done a lot of that with the, with the zoning ordinance. So going into that code, was that, that test was pretty easy. 
Um, and then there's management stuff about budgeting for running a department and that kind of stuff. Um, but then the other one was the technical module, which is a lot harder for me because I didn't wasn't a plumber or an electrician. And so I'd like I had to go through all those codes to get familiar enough with the technical side. The, the good part about it is it's not asking you if you know the code. It's asking the exams are always asking you, do you know how to find the answer in the code? Because they're open book. So if you can find the answer in the code, where to look for it and put that on the test, then you're going to pass. Right now, I think there's actually three tests you have to take. There's a technical one, there's a legal one, and what they call code specialist. Um, you have to take, you have to pass all three of them within a two-year period. Um, I would give yourself three to six months to study and get ready for each of the tests. So I would think you could do it in a year to year and a half to kind of prep for each one of the tests and then take them and pass. Um, and that way, then even if you didn't pass one, like I didn't pass the technical one the first time I took it, I had a chance to take it again before the other one I took expired. So that way you've got time uh, before the first one you, you pass uh, starts that two year window to pass the others. Um, but if you could, you could do it in, uh, in nine to 12 months, uh, you know, certainly a year and a half with, uh, with prep uh, to go through all the three different tests and pass them all within that window. Great, thanks, uh, Jonathan. Let us know how that goes for you. Um, final question up is from Eric the Red. I'm pretty sure that's Scott Hansen. Uh, oh. In 2012, a hotly debated change to the IRC was a requirement for residential buildings to be sprinklered for fire safety reasons. Many communities still routinely remove this requirement when they adopt the latest edition of the IRC for duplexes and single family homes. Are there any other examples of much debated changes in more recent IRC codes, 2018, 2021 editions, that planners should be aware of when we participate in pre-development meetings? Yeah, I think the other the other big one that I could see being where, um, so, so what Scott's talking about is that um, it, uh, starting with the 2012 codes, it basically says all, all homes need to be sprinklered. All homes need to have automatic fire sprinklers, um, but either a lot of individual jurisdictions take that out or like in Missouri, you can't do it at the, at the city level at all. Uh, it's just state law and that's not uncommon. So it just that part of the code doesn't apply depending on what your jurisdiction is. Um, the, the thing that I would think would be the next one to be divided out between the code says this, but op adoption of it is very uh, hit and miss and very scattered would probably be the solar energy provisions. Um, there's a lot now, like in the California building code, any building has to either have solar uh, cells on it, solar power, or be built to accommodate it in the future. Um, and so that would be a, a jurisdiction, the state that's basically saying, we want to be as solar ready as we can every time we build something. Um, and other states I could see doing just the exact opposite of going, you can't mandate that every building is going to be ready to have solar panels on it and a photovoltaic system in the future. Um, and that if the code is going to basically say, yeah, anytime you build or remodel, significantly remodel a building, put the things on it so that it's ready to have solar power. Um, I could see a lot of jurisdictions going, we're just not ready to do that, or that just doesn't make sense for us. And then that would be something that again, would be kind of hit and miss that it's in the, it's in the, it's in the, in the code to apply nationwide, but then it, it's jurisdiction, yes or no, as to what that happens. Um, so that would probably be the biggest one. Um, the energy codes usually, that's not because that's binary. You either do it or you don't. The energy codes oftentimes a jurisdiction will lag behind. So it'll be like we're two cycles behind the standard. So we have an insulation standard. It's just not as high as the current. But solar energy provisions are really just either yes or no. You either do it or you don't. Um, and so that would be one where uh, a lot of jurisdictions would just say, we're not going to do this either at the state level or county or the city or something. Um, and some places would be built solar ready and some places won't. You have to draw everything to Great, thanks. All right, we have three uh, minutes left. Yeah, if know. anyone has any other questions, please use the raise hand feature or type something into the Q&A. The other thing I'll say just to encourage everybody is, um, you know, it, it, um, it it's good to go over and, and uh, you know, maybe go out with a building inspector and look at something, um, sit down with a plan reviewer and kind of go, when you're thinking about this use in this building, 
uh, or this address and this, you know, this property, what do you think about that's different than I think about when I'm trying to compare something to the zoning ordinance or the comprehensive plan um, and, and be able to kind of get that sense of, you know, well, when they see, uh, you know, this activity and this building, they start worrying about this or that. I don't know how many times I've been in a city council meeting where someone said, has anyone thought about this? And it's nice to be able to say, yes, I talked to the building inspections department and we've already thought about that issue and we've got a plan for it. Like maybe I don't know what the answer is, but they're already thinking that if we if the city council approves this and then they walk in and ask for a building permit, we haven't like, oh, well, nobody ever thought of this and this project's dead <laughs> and council just approved it because of something. So um, it's good to kind of scout that out going, uh, yeah, I know the fire marshal's aware of this and they're okay with moving forward or the building officials thinks that that can be resolved. Um, so include them in, even if they're probably not going to be a decision maker in those early stages of something. Um, I find it, uh, it helpful to be able to say, I've thought about this from their point of view. I consulted with them on this and at some city council meeting, you can kind of share their thoughts as to they're good with this or they're a little concerned or whatever. Um, so, so I kind of feel like bringing that voice into the equation where you don't always have, you know, the building inspectors at the city council meeting when you're talking about a rezoning of this, but you want to be able to get some input from them to know that they're comfortable with this if you approve it or, or they're only comfortable if you approve it this way or something. So um, that's a good voice to, uh, to include into your, uh, your conversations with the elected officials. Great. Well, thank you again, Joe. Great parting advice there. And uh, thanks to everyone who attended today. Um, this was, again, very informative, and we really appreciate your time. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and end the webinar, and I hope everyone has a great afternoon. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Bye. So that's why.